We're here again with Peyton and Lo. We got them to come back with another episode of Flight Tales. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Thanks for inviting me back. Uh, I guess today we decided to talk about common week areas I see on people. Yeah, on their coming check rides. On check rides, coming in on check rides. Yeah. One story we talked about the other day uh, on one of the other podcasts with Brennan. We were talking about whenever you simulate emergency landings. You had one time a uh, throttle cable break come out the panel, right? Yes. I uh, gave the applicant a simulated engine failure by pulling the throttle back, and about mm-hmm. two feet of cable came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the engine was still running, but at idle. Yeah. So you pulled it out, and it just kept coming? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, normally it comes out about six inches, right. but now like, oh, we had a couple of feet yeah, there, so the cable broke. So this was supposed to be a test, but we're yeah, really going to do it now. Yeah. So, so we, we dead-sticked it into a, I took the controls and dead-sticked it into a cow pasture. Oh, that was another thing we talked about. Like, how does that work? Like, uh, you know, it, do you take the controls or the students still do it, you know? It depends. Yeah. Well, we just stopped the check ride at that point and finished it another day. Anyway, we, we got the aircraft on the ground safely. It was a, cow pastures are generally speaking pretty bumpy. Oh, yeah. So that's why it's so important if you're landing off airport to get the airplane slowed down as much as possible, which means full flaps and yeah. uh, soft field landing. Mm-hmm. The main problem was not the landing. It was the fact that there were lots of cows in the pasture. <laughs> yeah. the cow, and the cows are curious. They like to come over and rub on the airplane and that bends things. Yeah. So we didn't want that to happen. Uh, this was back before everybody had a cell phone and as in this particular instance, neither one of us had one. The applicant's job was to keep the cows away from the airplane while I went over to the hiked over to a farmer's house and made a phone call. And ultimately, they were able to fix the airplane and fly it out. Oh, OK. Yeah. So a- after that, I've started always doing simulated engine failures over uh, crop duster strips or yeah. someplace where we actually have a place to go <laughs> uh, learning from experience. There. Yeah. Cowless fields. <laughs> That's right. Cowless fields. <laughs> so you had s- have some things that uh, I guess in applicant for any check rod, usually some mistakes or things that well, people. Yes. Have I mean, we with. always start out by looking at the application on yeah. IACRA, and there's some common mistakes I see on the 8710 form that could be eliminated if the recommending instructor looked for these things before he signed the application off and fixed them ahead of time so that we don't have to fix them on check ride day. Yeah. Starting out with the name of the applicant, if the applicant has a middle name, it has to be on the application. It can't just be an initial. Okay. If your name middle name was John, you couldn't just have a J. Yeah. John has to be written there. IACRA actually will accept that, but it'll get kicked back when it gets to Oklahoma City. Okay. Yeah, you'd think IACRA would take all would, would kick it back. That would uh, be a struggle if your middle name was actually J, just a J. (laughs) Well, (laughs) if that is the case, then you would put just a J. And then you'd have to explain it when they try to kick it back? No, they would. It wouldn't kick it back if it was just the J. So they check your ID or something. Yeah, they know. They know because you get your student pilot's license through IACRA. Right. And so they, I guess, compare it to that. Well, and actually, if they do not have a middle name, there should be, um, if his name is John Smith, it should be John N M N. Smith, no NMN standing for no middle name. Oh, okay. Oh, man, learning all kinds of stuff. <laughs> it's in the instructions for IACRA. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got to read the instructions. <laughs> well, it's probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on, the birth, on the date of birth, uh, people from other countries sometimes put the day first instead of the month. IACRA won't catch that either. If your applicant is from a country where they do that, and he puts his birthday down that way, IACRA will take it, but it'll get kicked out when it gets to Oklahoma City. Okay. How long send it to get kicked back? Well, uh, it's usually a couple of weeks. Okay. So it's not like tomorrow. No. So it is a big deal if you do something wrong and it gets kicked back. And you have well, to- it gets kicked back to um, my what I, what we call a managing specialist, the FAA inspector who I report to gets it and then he sends it to me. I have to fix it. I have to make the correction. Sometimes that requires getting the applicant to make the change because I'm not really supposed to change anything on these applications. Gotcha. And, and if you don't I, know the information, you got to call them. And, exactly. Yeah. So it's a bit of a process yeah. and it delays, obviously, the permanent certificate arriving 
for the applicant. Gotcha. But they only have the temporaries only last for uh, 120 days. That's correct. Right? So, so if it keeps happening, you could be without. Yeah, you could not have your license. It can expire, and then you can't fly. Exactly. Because you don't have your license. That's so right. how long typically until you get like your real license? It takes about 60 days average oh, okay. from the time you take the check ride. It's about 60 days until your permanent certificate comes in. Gotcha. So you already have to wait a good amount of time. Yeah. So waiting weeks and weeks and weeks extra. Yeah. That's right. The date of issuance of the pilot certificate, which is on the 8710 here, when you fill out your application on IACRA, the IACRA database, if you're already a rated pilot, let's say you're a private pilot going for an instrument rating, yeah. the date your private pilot certificate was issued is going to be in the IACRA database. So that's what's going to come up yeah. automatically. <clears throat> so let's say you're a private pilot. You took your instrument rating today. So you get a new new certificate issued today. That certificate is not going to be in the FAA database for a couple of weeks. Oh, okay. So if you now take another check ride in a couple of days, let's say you do your commercial in a couple of days, it's still going to show when you fill out the IACRA application, it's still going to show the date the private certificate was issued. Okay. And you're going to have to edit that to show that his certificate was issued the day he took his instrument rating, which was in this case today. Yeah. You would need to edit that on the IACRA form. For the commercial so check, the commercial, right? Yeah. Oh, so it doesn't just it it just it's doesn't not automatic. It doesn't exist. It's not automatic. It's it just whatever's in the in the database, and it yeah. takes as we said a couple of weeks after the date of the test for the information to make it into the FAA database. Yeah. So it's like it hasn't happened yet unless they go in and say it happened. Exactly. That brings up while we're on the subject of of that. If it's a private pilot coming in, he has a student pilot certificate. Student pilot certificates used to be paper. Yeah. Until about seven years ago, uh, when they changed to the plastic card like we have now, the student years. pilot application was the back of the third class medical. When you learned to fly, yeah, that's the way it that's was. That's what it was. Yeah. You went to the dock, got your third class medical. The back of it was the a student, student pilot yep. certificate. You can sign the back. And, and all that's that. what the flight instructor did. He signed the back yep. before you, he sent you out solo. Well, all of those paper certificates have expired because they expired the same day that the medical certificate did. Okay, yeah. So if you get a student who started his flying 10 years ago and has a paper student pilot certificate, it is no longer valid. You have to issue them a new one. A uh, new so we need to go in IACRA and do all the paperwork. That's as right. If, he never if, flew if they show up to take their check ride and they have a paper student pilot certificate, not only can we not do the check ride, but all the solo flying they've done has been illegal. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's so. Scared, uh, bottom scared. line is, if you get a student who started his training a long time ago, don't just ask him if he has a student pilot certificate. Ask to see it. Yeah, and if it's not a green card. You have to issue him a new one. And when you issue a student pilot certificate, it doesn't immediately print out the temporary like it does if you get a new rating. Oh, yeah. It takes a few days after you, as the flight instructor, uh, do the IACRA application, sign off on it. A few days later, they get an email from IACRA saying, log in and print out your temporary certificate. Yeah. So I noticed that with, with us, like we do that. And um, the student may not – might miss the email. Yes. Not see it. And then you got to tell them, yeah, you need to go back in there and log in and print out the temporary. Yes. And I've had occasions when people show up to take a, a private check ride and they don't have a student pilot certificate in their pocket. Yeah. Maybe they have the temporary that was issued six months ago, but they never got the permanent one in the mail. For so whatever reason. And so even though they do have a student pilot certificate, it shows in the database, you have to have it in your pocket. Yeah. You have to have it with you. Okay. A valid yeah. current one. Yeah. So they would have to figure out. Well, yeah. So the flight instructor, really a good flight instructor is probably going to follow up with yeah. the student after he issues the student pilot certificate on IACRA. He's going to check with him in a week or so and say, did you get the email? Did you print it out? And then... A month or two after that, you know, did you get your yeah, did you get permanent the certificate? One, yeah. Just kind of make sure that they got it because yeah. it's easy to overlook it if you don't understand how the system works. Yeah. 
occasionally I see applications that have two aircraft to be used. You know, we've got this block here where we put the type aircraft to be used for the check ride. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, I see applications that have two aircraft there. Now, the only time you would actually have two aircraft there is if you were going to use two aircraft for the check ride. Yeah, I remember like when in the, you used to have to provide a complex airplane, and some people would do one plane for most of the check ride, and then part of the rest of the check ride for the complex. That's correct. Yeah. Both the commercial and the flight instructor ratings used you used to have to have a complex airplane for yeah. those tests. Well, they've changed the rule now. Uh, you don't have to have a complex airplane. So rarely will there ever be two airplanes in there. About the only time I see it now is an applicant who wants to take a private check ride in a Cub or a Champ or an airplane that doesn't have an attitude indicator in oh, it. Oh, okay. So they can't do the required instrument part of the ride in their own personal airplane. So they have to use another airplane to do the hood work. Yeah. In that case, you would have two airplanes. You'd have two sets of numbers in the flight time and the pilot in command time, where, which is in the type of airplane that you're using. The top number would be the first airplane. The bottom number would be the second airplane. Yeah. And IACRA has a place to put two airplanes in there. The mistake I'm seeing is people think because they learned, they did their flight training in a 172 and a Cherokee, that they should have two airplanes in here because they learned to fly in two different types of airplanes. So this is strictly for the type of aircraft you're going to use on the test. Do you ever see anybody, uh, I know they've got a simulator line there. Do you ever see anybody put anything in those boxes? Yes. And just because they use the simulator in their training? Is that how? Is that the thought process? Oh, you're talking or? about the simulator time in those boxes? Yeah, even no, no. when it's not required. Like, no, I haven't seen that. Okay, but it shouldn't be there. Obviously, yeah. Like the simulators we have, you can do like ten hours towards your instrument because they're BATDs, and I didn't know if anybody did that and then like might have lo- showed it on the. I, I haven't that, seen that, but it's, I guess it could happen. It could. Yeah, it could. That counts as regular. Flying, right? So well, yeah, actually, there's actually a block on the application to put the simulator time or the ATD time in. Yeah. Gotcha. Separate block. Yeah. Under the record of flight time. A lot of times I see people only fill out the required blocks, which will work. But it's a good idea to put to fill out every block that you have information for, just because if you ever lose your logbook, you can get this form from the FAA, you can get them to send it to you, or you, possibly the DPE has it in his files. Or in a perfect world, after the check ride, you just get a copy of this. Yeah. My point is, if you ever lose your logbook, this is an official document. You can use a copy of this to recreate your logbook officially. Under class totals, that's commonly getting overlooked. And the FAA wants to see that block filled. But I'm finding people who think class means classroom time oh yeah okay that's the number of hours that they taught ground school class yeah. which is not what it is it's class is airplane single engine airplane multi-engine okay yeah so they want the and typically on a private pilot he doesn't have any multi-engine time so it's all going to be single engine land pic class time yeah and it's a separate block over here so it's commonly getting overlooked i know that it's I want to say it's a fairly new block, but it's been probably been there for seven years. You know, it's been there time. for a long time, but the FAA wasn't wasn't really watching whether it was filled out or not. But yeah. now I've, I've heard I haven't had any kicked back, but I've heard of cases of applications being kicked back okay. because that block wasn't filled. So make so, sure you fill that block. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. the fun part of filling out the application, figuring out all the time. Especially that's right. You're going for commercial. That's right. Yeah. As a recommending flight instructor, when you sign somebody off for a check ride in IACRA, it digitally signs the top of the second page where the instructor's yeah. sign off goes. I recommend that after you sign it in IACRA, print the application and then in ink next to where it's digitally signed, sign your name in ink oh, and okay. give that application to the student to take with him to the check ride because with a signed application like that if iacra is down or the internet's down you can still do the test and and use a paper file i think we had an issue one time where i didn't print it out and iacra was down 
Well, it happens. And yeah. I've, had, I've had cases where people came from out of town, oh, maybe yeah. from Houston to take a check ride and they get over here and Niagara's down. They don't have a signed application. And you can't just sign one as a flight instructor. You can't just sign one and scan it in and send it to the oh, DPE. Okay. You have to have an original copy signed in ink. OK. So you can't go wrong by just always printing it out after you sign it digitally, sign it in ink, give it to the applicant as a backup just in case. Yeah, okay. Having said that, you know, you as the flight instructor, when you get a new student, are probably going probably going to be teaching them how to register an IACRA. Mm-hmm. You're going to show them how to do it. Make sure that when you do that, that you write their FTN number, their username, and their password in the front of their logbook so that they'll always have it. Because I see plenty of cases where people show up on check ride day, they have their login information saved on their computer at home, or oh, else their really? flight instructor has always logged in for them yeah. and they don't know how to log into IACRA. Yeah. I always make them send me their FTN number ahead of time so I can look at the application, make sure there's no errors on it before check sure ride day. Yeah. But I don't have their login information. So if they don't have it and now we have to change the password, now we're. You're wasting time for the check. Yeah, that's right. We're wasting time. Yeah. So just make sure they know how to log in and they have their information. We need to make sure also that our applicants have not only have, but have seen and understand the ACS or PTS for the test that they're taking. Oh, yeah. That, I mean, we always try to we always try to go over that. Not everybody does. Yeah. Um, you know, I always ask the applicant, have you seen the ACS for private pilot? And the answer is always almost always yes. They've seen the little book, but they've never opened it and looked at it. Oh, never read it. They've never anything. read it. They've never they don't understand how it works. Yeah. And really, that's the instructor's responsibility is yeah. to sit down, spend some time with them. Walk them through the book, show them how it works, show them where the reference materials. In other words, when you look at the ACS, at the top of each maneuver, there's a set of references. And it's an FAA code, like the FAA uh, 8083-3 is the Airplane Flying Handbook. Yeah. But it doesn't tell you it's the Airplane Flying Handbook. Yeah, you have to go. You have to know how to decode that. Yeah. And the decoder ring for that is actually in the back of the ACS. There's a list of all the references. There's a list of all the acronyms. But my point is the they don't know where to look when I when I ask them what that is. They say, well, I don't know. That's some kind of FAA code. But my which tells me that nobody's ever showed them how to use the references. Yeah. How to decode what they are. Speaking of acronyms, what's the ACS? (laughs) Airman Certification Standards. Gotcha. So that's how that's how he uh, that's what the private pilot test is based on on so tells you what maneuvers he has to do, what kind of ma- topics oh, he has so to you, cover. So that's you really the test. Should read it's that. the sheet of music that yeah. the examiner plays off of. Yeah, gotcha. it's the test. It's you the standards the for all, it's all the maneuvers and the standards for those maneuvers mm-hmm. and what you're expected to know. And students can read that. Absolutely. Yeah. They yeah. should read it. But sometimes you're saying it's, they don't? No. That's crazy. It's <laughs> online. It's online. And then you can buy the book too. You know, like we had the book in the in our kits that we sell to all the new students. But when they're ready to start, um, we have an ACS book in there. Gotcha. That's like saying, here's a book. The test will come from this. Yeah. And they don't read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I mean, you know, when I usually try to tell people when they go do their solos, here's the standards that you have to make sure when you do this maneuver, you know, plus or minus 100, plus or minus 10 on your heading, plus plus or minus 100 on altitude, whatever the standard is, you go practice it and make sure you stay within these standards. It's not just applicants who haven't seen it. I often run into flight instructors who are not using it either. That's pretty bad. <laughs> well... <laughs> So the, the, it usually plays out like this. You know, we're required before we, after we finish the oral, we're required to do a pre-flight briefing, talking about what we're going to do, what maneuvers we're going to okay. do, that sort of thing. So when I'm going through the pre-flight briefing occasionally with an applicant, and we'll talk about a maneuver that we're going to do, and the applicant says, uh, I don't think I've ever done that maneuver before. Oh. I'll ask him, i say, you've never done it? <laughs> yeah. I go, well... Maybe we did it once six months ago, but I'm not sure. Oh, my God. Which, which immediately raises a red flag, uh, which makes me wonder if the flight instructor is using the ACS, because if he is using it, 
nothing will be omitted because he's using it as a guideline. Before he signs that applicant off, he'll sit down with the applicant, with the ACS, go down the list of every maneuver they might be required to do and make sure they understand how to do it. Yeah. That would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the test. Like, this well, is and, your test. <laughs> and there are there are maneuvers that uh, the, the where the DPE gets to, gets to select the way the maneuver is done. Uh, and a classic example where I see a lot of uh, errors, shall we say, is the power on stall. The ACS allows the power on stall to be wings level or in a bank up to a 20 degree bank turn to the left yeah. or the right. And I find a lot of people who have only been taught to do it wings level. They've never done it in a turn. So now I typically have them do it in a turn. So now they're doing it for the first time on their check ride. And we try to avoid any scenario where we're doing anything for the first time yeah. on a check ride. Yeah. <laughs> So that tells me the flight instructor is not using the ACS because if he was using it, he would have read through that and said, I need to teach this all three ways because yeah. the DPE gets to choose. Yeah. It's like the flap setting for slow flight. The DPE gets to choose the flap setting. Yeah. I can have them do it with no flaps or full flaps, anything in between. If they've never, if they've only done it one way and they'd ask to do it a different way on the test, it may not turn out too well. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's scary that they're not following. Well, so that. again, it's not just the applicants; it's, it's the flight a, instructors yeah. who are not reviewing the ACS. Maybe they looked at it when they were studying for their CFI check ride. Mm -hmm. They were pretty sharp on it then, but maybe that was five years ago, and they haven't looked at it since. And things have changed, yeah. and they do things do change. Yeah, I mean, I remember what it used to be the PTS, and now it's the ACS. So I mean, if and there was a time when there wasn't either one. Oh, yeah. I don't there was no PTS that. or ACS. We had, we had what were called flight test guides. Oh, okay. And they were fairly ambiguous, which gave – there were a lot of DPEs who were not on the same sheet of music back in those days because yeah. you could do things independently, uh, Yeah, I guess is one way to put it. Yeah. <clears throat> but the FAA recognized that, and in trying to standardize the way things are done, they came up with the PTS, and now it has evolved into the – ACS. Yeah. You know, a good flight instructor is going to be reviewing the ACS, making sure he has the most comp, most current copy, which you can you can download it on the FAA website. Make sure you have the most current one and mm -hmm. and use it. Yeah, all this stuff is uh, free to look at on the FAA website. It is. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of things that have changed over the years. Yeah. Uh, big changes. The most striking example for me is the normal approach and landing. When I learned how to fly, a normal approach and landing was basically a power off one eighty. It was a power oh, off really? gliding approach because the mindset at the time was that you always needed to be in gliding distance of the runway when you're in I've a traffic flown pattern. With some people who say well, that. that's the way we used to teach it. Yeah, that's the way I was taught uh, when I first became a DPE. That's the way we were. We were uh, you always want to stay close to the runway to where you if you lose an engine. That's you can right. Come. Okay. And there's no way that you can do a stable approach power off. And now the FAA wants a stable approach. And yeah. we'll talk more about that later. But the point is, uh, you can't do it power off. And I'm still seeing people who are being taught to do it that way. Typically, their flight instructor is an old dog who yeah. is not going to change his ways. Yeah. <laughs> he still thinks that's the best way to do it. Yeah. There are others that are just as significant but my point is you can't rely on the way you were taught to do these maneuvers necessarily especially if you've been doing this for quite a while you have to make sure you're teaching things the way the faa wants it taught evolve with it exactly yeah yeah and there are reasons they change it yeah. for safety primarily i mean that power off gliding approach uh there is a pl there is a place for that it's an engine failure in the traffic pattern mm-hmm but it's not a normal approach. I know that I was I was just thinking of when um like the when I did my t type rating and then when I've done some training and for the King Air and stuff, you know, in the simulator when I first started they would want you to power through on a stall like you do a power on stall or power off stall and they just want you to keep the nose level and just full power. And then after I want to say it was after the Air France accident they started changing it up a little bit. Yes, that was one of the driving factors. But you're right. The, the emphasis on stalls used to be recover with minimum loss of altitude. Yeah. And so we tried to power out. And in a high performance airplane, you can power out. But they were having events where airplanes were stalling at high altitude. And you can't power out up there. Yeah. 
and people were trying to recover with minimum loss because you're IFR when you're yeah. at high altitude. So if you lose more than 300 feet of altitude, you're going to get an altitude bust. So they were having airplanes stall at high altitude. Typically, it's a crew that's trying to get above the weather mm-hmm. or they're trying to get up for more favorable winds. They get too, to too high an altitude too soon based on their weight or the temperature at altitude. They get up there, turn the autopilot on, and now they're not paying attention anymore. They're talking about wine, women, and song, (laughs) and the airplane's (laughs) gradually slowing down. Yeah. They don't notice it till the stick shaker activates, and typically shortly after that, the autopilot disengages, Mm -hmm. and now they're trying to recover without losing more than 300 feet. They get a secondary stall and lose control of the airplane, and they lose 10,000 feet instead of a few hundred. Yeah. So the FAA, based on instances like that, had rethought the stall recovery process to, and the mindset now is let's get the nose down. Yes, we're going to lose some altitude, but we do not want to get a secondary stall. We're going to lose a little bit of altitude in the process of doing it. It's not just about minimum loss of altitude anymore. When I first did the, the my type rating, it was, it was just off from what your primary training is because your primary training was lower the nose, full power, and recover. And then when I got to the type rating, they were just power out of it. Right. But then they changed it. Well, now we're doing uh, we're doing high altitude stalls in the simulator yeah. where they take you up to, you know, 41,000 feet, have you turn on the autopilot, pull the throttles back to idle and wait until the airplane stalls. So you're actually doing the stall with the autopilot engaged so that you have to disengage it for the recovery. But not only have they emphasized that it, that it's not just about minimum loss of altitude, but they started giving us training in high altitude stalls, which we didn't used to do all the stalls in the simulator. And maybe the way you did it in your type rating, they were all done. I don't know. They did some in the traffic pattern in the simulator, but most of them were up in the ten to fifteen thousand yeah, foot level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's about where right where they were. So they've changed the way they're doing that now. Those those high altitude stalls are required now in the simulator. It's just another example of how they've rethought the way they want things done over the years, and that's why it's important that we're using the most current ACS. So download an ACS. Yeah, and look at it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and look at it. Talking about private and commercial tests now, common weak areas, and here we're kind of talking about the oral portion of the test. How to defer inoperative equipment is a common weak area. I see a lot of people, again, who, when I give them a, give them a scenario of a, a discrepancy discovered during pre-flight, just in this case, just say it's a landing light that's not working, yeah. and ask them, uh, can we fly the airplane with a burned out landing light? They don't know the process. So they don't know where to find it and then what to do after to, uh, to continue the flight. You know, they might say, well, I need to uh, I need to defer it. Okay. Well, how do we defer it? And yeah. how do you know you can defer it? Yeah. So they need to know how to get into 91205 and see if it's required and then how to go to 91. 91- 213 to see how to defer it if it's deferrable. Obviously, they need to look in the POH and see if it's required too. Yeah. But what a lot of people don't have any comprehension of is a, is a minimum equipment list. Yeah. Now, as you know, under Part 91, we don't have MELs typically. Yeah. But they don't understand the fact that they don't have an MEL. They don't know what an MEL is. Not that they need to know how to use one, but they need to know they don't have one. That was one of the things that I had. I didn't. I mean, I heard. I remember MELs when I was learning, you know, getting my private. But, like, we never, I didn't quite know what it looked like. I have one that I got from Acadian for the King Air that Kent let me borrow. Yeah, so it, it's so a good idea. Show people. Because they're all different. I mean, if yeah. you're working for an airline as opposed to working for a charter operator, they're both going to have an MEL because you have to have one under Part 135 or 121, but they're going to be different. Yeah, they're, they're going to look it different. It may be the same airplane, but the procedures of what you do and how you defer it and where you put the placard and all those things are custom tailored to each individual operator and yeah. the equipment that they have installed in their airplane. So I guess for a private or commercial pilot, it's good enough to know that we don't have an MEL and that if I 
go to work for United. They're going to teach me how to use their MEL, so I don't really need to know that now, but I do need to know how to deal with a a non-MEL environment, which is what we're operating in in terms of how to defer equipment. Yeah. That's getting overlooked. Airplane performance at higher elevation airports. Now, in this part of the world, everything's at sea level. So the applicants have seen the difference that temperature makes in the performance of the airplane, but they haven't seen the difference that airport elevation makes in terms of takeoff, landing, and climb performance. Mm -hmm. I always give them a scenario during the oral where we're simulating operating out of a high elevation airport. Aspen's a good example. It's at 7,800 feet. Probably not going to go there in a 172, no, but it's, it's, a, be a it's kind of an extreme example. It, brings, yeah. it, it, it shows the major differences in performance. But I'm, I'm finding a lot of people, typically they can find the chart in the POH, and they can f- come up with the numbers, the takeoff and landing distance numbers. But when you start talking about why the numbers are different, they don't really understand why. The, they, they can tell me that the air is less dense. And that's true. That is the bottom line. Yeah. But they don't really have much insight into how less dense air results in a longer takeoff and landing roll. The answer I typically get is that, well, the reason the takeoff roll is longer is because there's less lift in the less dense yeah, air. Yeah, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> And the <laughs> reason I typically get for the landing distance being longer at the high elevation airport is there's less drag, oh, which is not true. No. The lift and the drag are the same at the same indicated airspeed, but with, which brings up the whole understanding of the difference between indicated and true airspeed and how true airspeed is affected by being at a higher elevation. Yeah. So my point is they're kind of at the rote level of learning if they can just tell me it's less – dense air that's causing it. We want them to be at the correlation level of learning and understand why the less dense air results in the decreased performance. Mm -hmm. So that's getting overlooked in a lot of cases. Okay. So why does it? Why does? Why does it result in decreased performance? Well, you have to understand that there there are a number of reasons. Engine performance is affected at higher elevation. Propeller performance is affected, so you have slower acceleration on takeoff roll. The difference between indicated and true airspeed, the higher you go altitude-wise, the bigger the split between indicated and true airspeed. So that when you're flying up at 10,000 feet, let's say, and you're indicating 100 knots, you're going a lot faster than you are indicating 100 knots at sea level. Because the air is less dense and you have to be moving faster to get the same indicated airspeed. Gotcha. So that's a that level of knowledge which puts them means which means they really understand what's happening is not there in a lot of cases. Yeah. So would you would you accept one of those as an answer? Or are you or would you accept a an explanation to where you know they understand why? Well, you have to consider we're in a testing environment when I'm as- asking these questions, and I can't really offer any instruction. I can ask the question a different way or kind of try to backdoor the question to see if they know the answer, but maybe just don't understand my question. Gotcha. Uh, sometimes I can work around that particular situation by asking them how the airspeed indicator works. Gotcha. So if they understand it, It should be an easy way. It should be easy to answer any of those. Absolutely. Gotcha. When somebody takes a check ride with me, I I, I know that they then talk to their other flight instructors and they talk to other students. What did he ask? What did you talk about? So word gets out. That's why I try not to get the same, give the same test every time. But my point is, if if a, a private applicant, I ask him that question and his buddy just took a check ride with me last week and we had this issue and the guy says, well, the reason is because the true airspeed's higher. Okay, well, that's the correct answer. But then I'll, I'll, I will then ask him, how does true airspeed result in a longer landing roll to see if they can dis- explain yeah. how it does? Instead of just memorizing an answer. Well, that's right. That's right. The FAA encourages us to ask scenario-based questions. And I always encourage flight instructors to ask their students scenario-based questions. Yeah. And I mean, that's how I try to do, like, if somebody's going for a check ride, I try to do scenarios, make up some kind of, a lot of times, like when I'm doing it, the student thinks it's a trick question and 
I'm not trying to get it's a pretty simple question, but I guess, you know, if they don't quite understand it that well, then it would they might think it's a trick question. They hear it as a question. riddle instead of a real question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As an example, uh, a scenario based question I might ask a private applicant is we're coming into land. Um, we're trying to decide what flap setting to use based on today's conditions. What scenario, what situation is going to make you decide to do a no flap landing in this airplane that has flaps? Ooh, it does. To me, <laughs> I, the well, little now bit. they have to think about yeah. it. You know, they have to think about I've, oh. and, and when I see them thinking, they don't have an answer. I ask them, have you ever done a no flap landing? Yeah. And sometimes the answer is no. Oh. The little bit I know, it sounds like a trick question. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not a trick question. It's, it's a scenario to get them to think about how they decide what flap setting yeah. they're going to use. Yeah. So in this case, if I ask them if they've ever done no flap landing, they say yes. And I said, well, what were you practicing for? When are you going to actually use that? Yeah. So, well, oh, so there be... really is no real reason to do a no flap well, landing. Well, there isn't a real reason. The flaps aren't working. I was about yeah. to say, or the flaps yeah. broke off or, or something. I don't have flaps okay. in my airplane. Yeah. yeah. So I could, but, I could have almost answered that question. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. But my point is, maybe they've been taught to do a no flap landing. They've done one, but they were not given a scenario. They don't know when they're going to use it. Yeah. The instructor gotcha. never said, we're practicing for the day the flaps don't work, so we're going to do a no flap landing today. There was no why. There was no why. It was yeah. the how. Let's, I'm going to teach you how to do it, but I'm not teaching you why you're doing it. Yeah. And the way you asked it would be easy to answer had the instructor said, we're doing this in case your yeah. flaps aren't. Yeah, I gotcha. That's easy. Yeah. Well, and that brings up the next question of if we're going to do a no flap landing, what are we going to have to do differently? Yeah. And the answer, of course, I'm looking for is, well, we're going to have to have a higher approach speed. Okay. Why do we have to have a higher approach speed? Yeah. Because we have no flaps. Well, that's the answer. Because, <laughs> yeah. But the question is, what Did is I the approach sh- speed based on? Why is the approach speed higher when we don't have flaps? Again, the answer I'm looking for is we have a higher approach speed because our stall speed's higher. Yeah. Why is your stall speed higher? <laughs> well, you see how like, you yeah. can end up going down a rabbit hole real quick yeah. with a scenario-based question. If they understand and they're properly trained and understand what's going on and at the correlational level learning, they're easy questions. Yeah. yeah. There's no rabbit hole. There's it's no rabbit just, hole. Yeah. That's, That's right. cool. So basically just understand yes, how to fly. Yes, understand, <laughs> study. study. That seat back to well, studying. Study, yeah. Studying is a big part of it, but a good flight instructor who sits down and spends some time with his student talking about, before you even go fly, a pre-flight briefing where you talk about what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and why things are going are going to go the way they are before you get in the airplane goes a long way towards success yeah yeah shall we say well i think that could even if again i don't know much i am learning a lot which is really cool but it it sounds like it could go back to if the student would read the acs they should have questions as to why would they check for a no flap landing then ask their instructor hey why would they check for no flap landing if they were never taught it so it sounds like it could still be on the student to be like, I don't yeah. know why. <laughs> a no flap landing is not required on a private check ride, but it is certainly something you can ask for. Gotcha. So that wouldn't be in the ACS? Well, there's aerodynamics and that's kind of an aerodynamic. The, the no I flap say, landing yeah. per se is not a mandatory maneuver, but the, uh, the DPE has the option of, I could ask for a no flap landing if I wanted to, because it's part of the takeoffs and the takeoff and landings that we do. Um, because they should understand aerodynamics or, you know, I'm probably not going to ask for a no flap landing on a check ride. We're going to talk about it on the ground and make, I want to make sure they understand why Mm -hmm. occasionally I get a no flap landing without asking for one. So oh, there you go. <laughs> they forgot. To and put I didn't. The flaps I didn't in. give them a flap failure. I've asked them to do a normal approach in landing. I tell them what I what I want them to do. I'd like for you to make a a normal approach in landing. And they come in and they do a no flap landing. And after all, I'm not going to say anything while they're doing it. I'm you know I can't instruct and I'm not going to 
tell them what to do. Right, unless you're in danger. <laughs> well, after we get on the ground, I will ask them, I'll say, I'm just curious, why did you land with no flaps? About the only answer that really is acceptable is I was simulating a flap failure. And at that court, I'm going to say, well, I didn't give you a simulated <laughs> flap failure. So why were you simulating oh, it? We just did them yesterday. So I was so yeah. used to it. <laughs> but the answer I do get occasionally is that's the way I was taught to do it. I was going to ask. That's not great. Yeah. Do you ever get, oh, shh, uh, I forgot the flaps. Yeah. <laughs> well, typically it's not because they forgot it. It's because they were, that's they were the taught. way they were taught to yeah. do it. Oof. Doesn't sound like that's right. I don't know, but it doesn't sound like that's right. Well, I'll give you an example of, of a, a scenario, a situation where that exact thing happened. A guy came from out of town, came over here asking for a normal approach. He didn't know flap landing. His answer was, that's the way I was taught. I said, well, okay, um, that's not the way we do no flap landings these days. Yeah. And that's not the way we do normal, normal approaches landings, and landings. Yeah. And so I, uh, I uh, asked him to do a landing with flaps and he was able to do it. So I, I, I talked to his flight instructor after it was over and said, are you teaching no flap landings as, as normal approaches and landing? He said, yes. I said, why? He said, well, because we're training in a 172 and there is a placard underneath the flap handle that says avoid slips with flaps extended. And since a crosswind landing is a slip, you can't land in a crosswind with flaps either. So I just teach them to always do no flap landings unless it's a short field or a soft field landing. Oh. Uh -huh. So I, I was unable to convince him yeah. that, that that's not the right way to teach it. So we agreed to disagree with the caveat that in the future, if I ask one of his students for a normal approach and landing and he does it with no flaps, he's not going to pass. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Because that's not the right way to yeah. do it. Yeah. So I was unable to change his mind. He's old school. He is not going to change his mind. <laughs> Sounds like, well, yeah. well, none of your students will pass. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, and so in that, another problem I saw with that particular applicant is when I gave him a simulated engine failure from out, you know, we were up at three or 4,000 feet after doing our air work over the top of a crop duster strip. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I told him, I said, fly the airplane as though you're actually going to land. I'll tell you when to go around. And we got down to, you know, somewhere around 500 feet or so. And he was high. And he had not put any flaps down. Oh, because because he had been taught. because he'd been trained not to land with flaps yeah. unless it was a short field landing. So my point is, his mindset was that I'm going to land with no flaps. And in a scenario Overshoot where he really field. needed flaps, yeah. he didn't use them. So I was supposed to say that would be dangerous, right? Yeah. You would overshoot the field or hit the trees it's on the end or fast, whatever. Right? It wouldn't be good. Yeah. So that's uh, we're, we're talking about, again, scenarios. We were talking about the no flap scenario as a possible one. I just think it's important to give whatever maneuver we're teaching, be it landings or stall recoveries or things like that. We need to give them a scenario for when they're actually going to experience it. Yeah. The power on stall in a turn, as an example, which we talked about earlier a little bit, the scenario for that is we're taking off. We're turning out of the traffic pattern. That's typically a left turn. We're turning to crosswind and the seat slides back. Yeah. So we get a big pull of up pull elevator yeah. or the door pops open and it distracts us. That's, that's kind of the scenario for what's going on. And so that's why we teach it that way. If they've only been taught to do it wings level, well, let's think about this power on stall and a climbing, onto the, climbing turn to the left as an example. Typically, it's a high power setting. It's a nose high attitude. We've got a lot of P factor. All the left turning tendencies are there. You're probably having to use some right rudder pressure to keep the ball centered. Mm -hmm. Normally in a left turn, you use left rudder. Here we are in a left turn having to use some right rudder pressure. If you're using left rudder pressure, you're in a skid. And what oh, happens yeah. if then you stall you could, the airplane in a skid? You could spin it. That's it. That's why that particular scenario is kind of worst case scenario. But it's important that they have seen that scenario and they understand why they need to keep the ball centered. Yeah. When you yeah. say spin it, <laughs> spin so like the plane just uh, it'll spin, yeah, it'll stall and then it'll come down and spin. Oh, now we have to practice that as as CFIs, as flight instructors. Uh, yeah, before we get to flight instructor, because a student might do that to us. 
They oh. only might, yes. but they will. I've yeah. had it happen. I've had it happen a few times I, on I, I check rides. I should use might. Uh, they will. <laughs> they will on and check rides. This has happened. Just yeah. Oh. I've had people lose control of the airplane on check rides. Typically, it's on this power on stall or on one of the stall recoveries because they've never done it before. Or? Yeah. Well, they've even never done it before. They're not doing it correctly. Yeah. The ball's not centered. Obviously, when they stall the airplane, yeah. extremely nose high attitude. Uh, usually you can usually see it coming yeah what i'm finding in spin recovery again i don't have to we're not going to do a spin in flight except on a flight instructor check ride if they have not been signed off in their logbook that they have instructional knowledge of spins then i have to actually do one on the ride which means you got to be in an airplane that you can spin so uh, we used to have to do spins on a cfi check ride a few years ago, the FAA changed the rule where if you have the endorsement, you don't have to actually do the, the maneuver during the ride. But my point here is in talking to private pilots and commercial pilots who have typically never done a spin, we still have to talk about spin recovery during the oral. And I find most people can give me the, the four steps to recover the, you know, the pair, power idle, ailerons neutral, rudder opposite, and elevator forward. They can spit those words out. But when I ask them this question, where is the elevator control when you get into the spin? Almost half of them say it's forward. Because they've never been in a scenario where the airplane is pointed down with the elevator back. That's counterintuitive because normally when the elevator is back, the airplane's in a climb. But here's a scenario where the airplane is pointed what feels like straight down with full up elevator and it is not intuitive to put it forward and people who've never had any spin training don't have any muscle memory and they don't put it forward. Well, so from an instructor's point of view, if you're going to talk to your student about how to recover from spins, make sure they have the visual that when they get into this maneuver, initially they're going to have full up elevator mm -hmm. and you have to put it forward. You have to push. You have to push the elevator forward. Show me what that airplane, how what it's pointed. Is? Well, yeah. Or how it's pointing when he's talking oh, about... Oh, oh. So, I mean, when you spin, you you have to stall, and then it, it kind of goes over like this, and then so just So, right spin. there, you have to push it forward. Yeah, once it... Yeah, you got to push it forward, because you've got the control all the way back, because you just uh, stalled it. And so, yeah. So, normally, you're like, pull it back so I can go up. But yeah, it, normally, when you would pull back, you just climb more. Oh, so is it because you're following the, tur the turn to push forward? You want to keep going... Does, does that kind of make sense? Well, you lose control of the airplane. The, the wings stall. There's not enough lift for the airplane to fly anymore. Uh, one of the wings stalls before the other one does. Which, so now it is, it's causing it to rotate. Rotation. And the only way you have to break the stall, which means you got to get the elevator forward. Gotcha. I mean, you can't pull it back anymore, so you no, have to get it no. back. That's like when you're skidding in a car to turn the opposite way. Yeah. Makes sense. Sorry, I don't. I could ask questions all day. I don't know much. <laughs> Not a pilot. I would. I would fail. <laughs> well, well, by the time you get to him, you should know all these answers. Yeah. You know. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you should. Yeah, you should. <laughs> it would be nice if everyone did. Yeah. It'd make my job a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it goes back to the I'm not I'm not trying to throw the instructors under the bus, but typically it goes back to the fact that the instructor may have taught him the four steps to recover, but he never mentioned the fact that, oh, by the way, keep in mind that you're going to be pointed straight down with full up elevator in the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to push it forward because that's it's counterintuitive when you think about it. Also, when you send a guy to a check rod, if you think about like he. Not only is he checking the student, but he's checking the instructor and making sure the instructor did what he was supposed to do to prep the student. Or, well, what I, you know, if, if that's I'm, how I think about it. If, anyway. I, if I'm working as a flight instructor rather than as a DPE and I'm I'm going to tell my student, I'm going to say, if you see anything in the ACS or any of the reference material that you're studying that's contrary to anything that I've told you or anything I've taught you, please point it out to mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Now you've opened the door for him to give you constructive criticism. If he's reading through the ACS and you're and you're getting ready to go do stalls the next day and he's he sees or you've done stalls and he sees that you didn't do them in a turn. You only did them straight ahead. He can come to you and say, hey, Ryan, I was looking in the ACS and I see that I might be asked to do this maneuver in a turn and we haven't done it in a turn. 
Well, that gives you the opportunity to say, thanks for showing me that because I was only taught to do them wings yeah. level. And you're right. I haven't been teaching them in a turn. Let's go do them. Yeah, let's go. Practice. If you don't do that, he may not. He may be intimidated by calling you out because oh, he's yeah. you're the teacher. He yeah. doesn't want to insult your intelligence, you yeah. know, by saying you're not yeah. doing your job <laughs> right. But if you open the door for them to give you constructive criticism, then I think that's a, a, a good way to to encourage them to tell you if they see something that's. Contrary to different than what you've been doing. Yeah. I'm talking about scenarios. I can't overemphasize the importance of using scenarios for training and testing. It works. Even scenarios for equipment failures, as an example. We talked about a flap failure earlier, but something as simple as a mag check. Yeah. You know, we'll see. You you do it all the time. You 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 do it all the time, and they know that there should be a drop. Yeah. And it it can only be so much. And, but when you give them a scenario, well, we're doing a mag check and we go to from both to left and there's no change in RPM. You'd be surprised how many people don't have never. Don't understand. They don't understand that. Yeah. They don't understand what they're doing when they do the mag. They know they're turning off a mag. Mm-hmm. That's the that is the extent of their knowledge on what a mag check is doing. Is that enough? Probably not. Yeah. They probably need to understand that not only am I turning off a mag, but the result of that is I'm only firing one plug in each cylinder. That's why we get a drop in RPM. Yeah. Yes, I'm turning off a mag, but you need they probably need to be able to take it a step further. What, why? Yeah. And if I go to a mag check and there's no drop in RPM, why why is that important? Well, you, know, you should know there's a problem, obviously. They should like, know there's a problem, but they need to know, if they do know the answer, say, well, I've got a mag I can't turn off. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, how is that a problem? How could that be dangerous? And they've never thought about the fact that it's a ground handling issue. Yeah. There, I don't recommend flying the airplane under those conditions, but you could. I mean, the airplane's yeah. still going to run fine, but you now have a scenario where if the if the next guy needs to move the propeller to put the tow bar on, yeah, it could get his head chopped off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My, there it is. <laughs> yeah, there it is. It's true. <laughs> uh, you know, another another scenario, again, I'm not going to give away all my scenarios here, but one I see commonly is carb heat. Yeah. You know, we know we get a decrease in carb heat during the run up. And why? Well, it's, it's hot air. Hot air is less dense. So my... My next question is, okay, that's correct. What effect does it have on the mixture? Yeah. And now, you know, I, some people may think, well, we're getting into trivia now. What difference does it make? Yeah. Uh, well, all we need to know is that it's hot air and it makes the RPM drop. So I will then give them a scenario to think about. I'll say, okay, um, here's the scenario. You're a newly rated private pilot. What's the highest altitude you've been to so far in your training? Typically, it's four or 5,000 feet. Yeah. Most of them haven't been up above 5,000 feet. Some have, but most haven't. Mm-hmm. And I'll ask him, I'll say, how have you been taught to lean the mixture? And in most cases, I've been taught to climb up to altitude, level off, trim the airplane out, and then pull the mixture back till I get a little drop in RPM and push it back in a little bit. And that's the quick and dirty way to lean. And I think that's the way most people are yeah. doing it in a 172. So I give them this scenario where you're a newly rated private pilot, you're taking your family to Destin, uh, up at 8,000 feet, you have a 50-knot tailwind. So you're going to go up and grab that tailwind, and you can make it nonstop now. Yeah. As you're climbing through about 6,000 feet, it's winter time. it's cold, it's colder at altitude, you're seeing some light rain falling from higher clouds. That raindrop's momentarily freezing, and then it blows off. So you're seeing freezing precip, and you correctly decide that you need carb heat. Yeah. So you turn the carb heat on, and the engine not only loses a little RPM, it starts running rough, and you're no longer able to climb. You're, you're hung there at 6,500 feet. So your mindset is, well, I must have some carb ice. It's melting. The water is going into the engine. It doesn't like that. The melted ice. Yeah. Once it all melts, I'm going to be good. But after about five minutes, it's still, still rough. Yeah. Push the carb beat back in, and, and now it smooths out. Pull it back on. 
it's rough again. Your passengers are going, uh, hey, Ryan, is that normal? You're yeah, going, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, so bottom line is, bottom line is, you just turn the car beat off. You're not sure what's going on, and you and you continue your climb. And sure enough, you do build up a load of carburetor ice, and the engine quits. Yeah. Well, so why was so <laughs> why was the engine wrong. running rough when you turn the carb heat on? Yeah. Well, if he's at the correlation level of learning and he knows that carb heat makes the mixture rich, he will then realize that, hey, I'm already a little rich here because I'm at 6,000 feet and I haven't leaned it. Now I just made it richer by turning the carb heat on. I need to lean it a little bit in order to keep it from running rough. And he does that and he doesn't have the engine failure because of carb ice. Yeah. So you see how, again, there's a scenario, scenario that could be. but if you as an instructor give them that kind of scenario during training, he's going to understand why it's important to know that the carb heat yeah. makes the mixture rich because it could bite him. Yeah. Unfiltered yeah, it makes air. you think a little bit different. Well, than- unfiltered air. Most of them can tell me that carb heat is unfiltered air. Yeah. But when I ask them why it's unfiltered air, they don't know. Yeah. They go, well... Increases the airflow and that makes the carb heat work better. I go, well, not that's not really what's going on. Yeah. I give them another scenario. We're taking off, headed out to the practice area, climbing through 1,500 feet and we hit a bird. And the engine starts running rough. What are we going to do in that scenario? Well, if the, again, if the applicant is at the correlation level of learning and realizes that the reason the carb heat is unfiltered air is in case the air filter gets blocked. They're going to go, I'm going to turn on the carb heat and fly back to the airport. If they don't know that, they're going to land on Interstate 10 and get run over by an 18 wheeler. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so take your choice. Would you that's, rather understand how the so, car, why carb heat is unfiltered yeah. air, or do you want to take your chances on I 10? <laughs> that's how we end this episode. <laughs> that's, so, it. That's, it. It. that's it. That's it. We're done now. <laughs> Flight Tales. Woo-woo. If you made it this far, you listened to the entire episode. And for that, we would just like to say thank you, and we hope you enjoyed it. We would also like to thank Peyton for coming on the show and sharing his story. If you have any questions about today's episode or suggestions for future episodes, just leave a comment or message us, and we'll do our best to answer. If you'd like to check out some fun aviation videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Owens Flight Training. Or if you'd like to get more information on becoming a safe, knowledgeable, and confident pilot, just head over to our website, owensflighttraining.com. Flight Tales